Well, hello and welcome to COVID-19 India Fights Back. I'm your host, Rajat Kane, and this is a program which gets you latest of India's fight against COVID-19 pandemic. Along with that, our world is fighting to strike back against this massive, gigantic health pandemic. Now, as we have been discussing about the new virus strain in this edition of the show as well, we'll take up this very crucial issue and how important it is to understand which group in terms of the age group happens to be the most vulnerable to the new strain and especially how careful should the growing up children need to be from this mutant. Now, cognizant of the pace of the spread the authorities worldwide have taken precautionary measure. Well, one of them happens to be a flight ban to and fro United Kingdom, the country, it was detected for the extremity of the spread for the first time last weekend. Now, several countries, including India, have already declared travel ban to and from UK. And of course, there are several set of SOPs that we'll take up as well. So how important it is to understand this new strain for its spread and the vulnerable groups. To discuss further on this very important issues, we are joined with Dr. Santa Das, he is scientist, ICMR, NICED. Well, many thanks for joining us, uh, Dr. Das. Dr. Shobna Gupta, she is Chief Medical Officer, Pediatric Department from Safdarshan Hospital, Delhi. Many thanks, ma'am, for joining us. And Professor Vasan, he is COVID-19 Project Leader, CSIRO from Australia. Many thanks to you, Professor Vasan, for joining us on this very important debate. Well, let me start this discussion with Dr. Santasabuj Das. He is scientist and he is from ICMR. Sir, first up, as, as we know, like uh, I, I'm not saying it's an alarming situation, but of course, like authorities of India as well, they have been cognizant of the spread of the virus, of course, in UK so far. Uh, which groups you would specify needs to be extremely cautious of this new mutant? The age group, I mean, Dr. Das. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this very important discussion. So this uh, new strain that has been uh, designated as you know, uh, strain under um, vaccine, uh, virus under investigation uh, 2020-12-01. Right. So this is uh, basically, you know, although uh, literature suggests that, you know, it was the, the first uh, mutations uh, happened as early as uh, September 20th, but mm -hmm. it's only you know, of late that it has started spreading uh, rapidly. And um, it is uh, predicted that maybe, you know, when we enter the new year, uh, the 60% of UK population will be uh, infected by this new strain. So this will, uh, this is, uh, it is presumed to replace the existing strain. Okay. okay. About other places, they may be still be present as you know, like in India too. Only thing that you know, we do not know about its existence because we are not doing that you know, aggressive sequencing that uh, UK does. Okay. Now, okay. Uh, the question is, you know, why is it uh, alarming, and if it is alarming, for whom? Now, virus having mutation, particularly RNA virus, is extremely common. You know, we know about common cold virus, so mm -hmm. that's why you know we do not have vaccine for that. So because it mutates very, and this is common cold is also the coronavirus. But the, the, the typicality here is that, you know, there are multiple mutations. So these mutations, it has around 17 mutations, okay, including important mutations in the, the receptor binding domain of uh, spike protein, which is, okay. you know, uh, responsible for entry. Hmm. So, yeah, 17. Now, these hmm. perhaps all mutations were isolatedly detected before, before that. But, you know, they are coming together in one virus is what is, you know, giving... Uh, making uh, us concerned. Okay, so many mutations accumulated uh, in, mm. in, a, in a particular strain. Now, this has, what scientists have uh, presumed that this has made the virus uh, more, um, uh, more uh, able to spread or, you know, faster spread uh, to the population and also spreading to younger population because we mm. know so far that, you know, uh, older population and with comorbidities, they were the, the usual sufferer. Okay, mm -hmm. But this virus, it is increasing ability to spread uh, 
is uh, is infecting uh, you know uh, increasing number of younger population mm -hmm. so now um, there was some uh, you know uh, assumption or you know some kind of um, uh, estimates i would say rough estimate mm -hmm. that it is 70% that's what you know uk prime minister said uh, that 70% more uh, capable of you know spreading but mm -hmm. whether this is just a, you know there were occasional spread in uh, some communities in some aggregate aggregation of people or it's just you know uh, really it will spread to the community um, and uh, eventually replace the existing strain is still not very clear okay mm -hmm. and now the question is is it going to make more severe disease two important questions whether it is going to increase the severity of infected uh, of infection and whether the vaccines that we are talking about uh, that will be uh, useful or we have to... You know, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Das, we, we'll come to that very important point okay. later in the show, but let me just, yeah, okay. let me go off to, uh, yeah, Dr. Gupta here, Dr. Shobhna Gupta from uh, Safdarjan Hospital, and she is, uh, she is specialist in the child care, as, and as you mentioned, Dr. Das, that the younger generation, the, I, mean, I beg your pardon, the, the younger age group uh, happens to be more vulnerable to this new mutant. Uh, Dr. Gupta, so usually if we talk of I mean, the holistic coronavirus or the parent coronavirus, what we have so far, which are the early signs among the younger children that they need to be wary of? See, uh, right now, as uh, we are, you know, already eight months into the pandemic, mm -hmm. so as we uh, discussed previously also, the children can present, this presentation in the children differs from the adult a lot. Uh, like mm. predominantly in adults, as we know, they present with mainly with the respiratory symptoms like cough, mm. difficulty in breathing, uh, and mm. problems, uh, 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 similar problems. But in the children, they can present either with fever, they can have any system involvement, like they are coming with the diarrhea, loose stools, vomitings, uh, rash on the body, you know, simple cough. So cough and pneumonia is one of the presentation, but okay. the children can present with loose tools, rash, even neurological complications. Children mm -hmm. are having a recurrent fits, so they can affect the brain also in children if it is severe enough. And mm -hmm. as known, 80% of the children are, have a very mild disease. So they, in fact, they are remain asymptomatic, but mm -hmm. they are able to spread the disease to the adult population. Okay. So both the asymptomatic and the symptomatic phase in the children are important. So mm -hmm. asymptomatic is important because they are the spreaders of the disease. So they can affect the other elderly population in the household or the other with the weakened immune system. They might be asymptomatic themselves, but they will mm -hmm. remain symptomatic. Uh, they will be spreader for a longer time. Okay. And another one more thing important in children is that as compared to adults, though they have a milder disease, but the spread of the virus from their nasal uh, the secretions is more, the viral load is more in the nasal right. secretions as compared right. to adults. So the transmission wise, they have a more capability of transmitting the disease. Hmm. And if you go to the clinical presentation, as I said, it can vary from asymptomatic disease to a mild disease like simple cough, coryza, mild fever, to a severe disease like which can result in the hospitalization of the children. So even 10% uh, of the children are known to have very severe disease, especially with the, the children of less than one year of age, which need hospitalization and even uh, aggressive treatment wise. So uh, the spectrum of the children is actually very wide. And uh, mm. in fact, we suspect COVID in each and every child coming to our hospital because okay. our is a tertiary care hospital. So in every child, we have to rule out COVID before proceeding to along with the other uh, things we are dealing with. And well, fever is uh, definitely a very predominant sign in children we have to look after apart from the other uh, symptoms. For well, that, that, that's a very important opening remark. Dr. Shobha Gupta, Shobna Gupta, please stay on. We'll come back to you. Uh, uh, Professor Vasan, uh, let me understand the nomenclature of the virus per se. Let's, let's, let's dissect this virus, the new mutant rather, more theoretically. As uh, Dr. Shobna Gupta just mentioned that uh, perhaps uh, children or... or uh, the growing up uh, uh, teenagers may not have any overt symptoms, but they're very strong carriers and the transmission from them happens to be fairly strong if we compare the other age group. So does the new mutant, uh, who, which, is, which is now known more for uh, uh, the extent of its spread, uh, does, does it make children more vulnerable to it? 
I think the correct way to think about it is we are all vulnerable to this virus, so we shouldn't let down our guard. And then, then, then you, said, the new mutant I'm talking of, sir, the yeah, particular I, I new mutant. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's see the virus, as uh, Dr. Das mentioned, mm -hmm. it's going to mutate, and it's you know until we conquer this virus, which will take a few years, it's going to be uh, a long haul. So there's no short term mm -hmm. fix to this. So that's worth mentioning. So whether you see there will be other mutations that are reported in in the coming months and okay. years, and that's inevitable. Okay. So and we need to manage public expectations on that, particularly mm -hmm. as the vaccine is pulled out. You will also find that there is a selection pressure on the virus, so you will find that the, there will be mutations, and we predicted this. Right. So my team here mm. back in March, we published April, we published a paper mm. which talked about accumulated mutations. So uh, there was a mention earlier of a G strain, which is the D614. Mm. Uh, now, if you look at it, that is a somewhat similar, I would say, to this particular uh, variant that we are talking about. And that one spreads faster as well. And it spread faster until it reached about 85, 90 percent uh, of the world sequences now contain mm. that mutation. Now, what you find is this new variant sits on top of that. So this new right. variant also has the G strain. It's on top of the G strain rather than the older D strain. OK, so this one also uh, has, spreads faster and that you mentioned so we are relying on data from the UK. I was in a WHO call last night where this data was once again presented that it is clearly more transmissible. There's no argument about that. Mm -hmm. There is also no evidence, and I stress this, uh, as of last night, where the data we saw, there is no evidence that this particular variant causes a more severe disease or okay. whether it causes more fatality. There's, there's no evidence, whether it is children mm -hmm. or elder population. And the UK data is has gone back for a few months and it involves at least a thousand cases in the last 28 days, 30 days. Mm -hmm. So it's not a sort of a short term data where you will have a lot of noise in the data. So mm -hmm. this is a reasonable data. And I don't think we need to be particularly alarmed at this stage mm -hmm. as long as we test the incoming passengers and we are able to uh, sequence the virus. So if, if someone is COVID positive during the quarantine period coming from abroad, particularly the affected countries, mm. we need to be able to sequence and ensure whether they are having that particular variant or not. And we need to do that very aggressively. I said this to you yesterday as well. And this is a, a real challenge for us. And, mm. and it's one that India can eminently meet. We have great sequencing abilities in different parts of India, particularly Gujarat. So yeah. I, I would say that children need to be more vigilant, obviously, mm. this seems to affect. But I don't believe that uh, it is going to give rise to particularly more severe disease. There's no evidence of that right now. Right, right, right. Uh, many thanks, uh, Professor Vasan. Uh, let me uh, come to you, uh, Dr. Santadas. Uh, sir, uh, you, you think that we need to study the correlation as uh, between uh, the, the spread or the extent of transmission and the severity of virus to understand this mutant further and also as any opening remarks you were talking about the efficacy of any medication in this case vaccine on the virus. Yes, yeah, certainly uh, we need to uh, study correlation between disease severity and the, the virus strain and uh, as Dr. Basan has already mentioned mm -hmm. that we have very good sequencing ability and government government's latest uh, guideline has said that anybody uh, coming or passing through, I mean, through transited through UK or coming directly from UK will be tested for um, COVID-19 and if positive, then they'll be tested for the particular strain. Mm -hmm. So eventually, you know, I, I assume, presume that uh, we will have uh, uh, strains, you know, uh, detected if they are coming. And also, if people have already uh, reached from UK carrying the uh, mutant and they are in the community, so, you know, we will eventually get the strain in the community also. And so, you know, once we have a uh, significant number, we'll see that whether there is any correlation uh, between the severity. But as of now, uh, as Dr. Basan already mentioned from UK studies, there is no uh, reason to uh, uh, Worry. be worried that, that it will yeah. be more severe disease. But one thing, you know, I uh, uh, 
presume that if it is more, uh, as it is almost now certain that it has more transmissibility, mm -hmm. so if it is uh, transmitted more, whether there will be more viral load in a, in an individual that compared is to the yes. state. And yes. that viral, more viral load may lead to more severe disease. There is a possibility. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, it's no certainty, but if there is more, carrying more virus, then it might lead to, for some viruses, it, it is there. You know, for corona, for COVID-19, it has not been correlated that well. Mm -hmm. uh, that way that, you know, that's why, you know, there was issues with the, whether we should uh, mention about the city value or not, because there is not direct correlation between viral load and the disease. Uh, but um, this is one possibility we have to, you know, uh, subsequently see. Regarding the vaccine efficacy, again, you know, virus mutation is not uncommon, it's pretty common. And uh, mm -hmm. so the vaccine, the neutralizing antibody as of now, uh, there's no evidence that the neutralizing antibody the vaccine will generate will not neutralize the virus, but we have to test that. So once mm. we have the strain, we have this plasma of the immunized individuals yeah. or people who has come up, come off the original parent virus, we have to see that whether the, their antibodies can neutralize the new strain. But mm. yes, I mean, if it keeps on accumulating more and more mutations, as we see for, you know, uh, common cold virus or, you know, for that matter, influenza virus, we need a vaccine, you know, every uh, year. So it's not a possibility, it's not an impossibility that uh, the current uh, batch of vaccine, you know, may need some uh, uh, modifications in the future if this particular mutation or, you know, uh, this mutation replaces and then accumulates more mutations. And because, you know, one thing is that, the question is that how this particular um, uh, strain accumulated so many mutations. Mm -hmm. So one possibility is that is the selection pressure that Dr. Vasan was telling. So is it that immunological selection pressure in an individual who was, you know, infected, maybe his immune system was not that competent or treated, you know, with multiple uh, medicines. Mm -hmm. So that selection pressure gave rise to this particular strain accumulating okay. so many mutations. Okay, so if that is the case, then immune escape uh, by, you know, accumulated mutations is not uh, uncommon, it can happen in the future. So we have to keep vigil. Uh, that's the only mm. thing, you know, we can, um, know how this new strain behave. That is what we have to keep close track of it. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Das, we need to be more cognizant, if not alarmed at this stage. And of course, it's, it's still early days in this virus, yet it hasn't shown any dangerous signs to say of. Uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, of course, like we need to study this virus, uh, rather this mutant uh, further, and especially it's, uh, uh, it's the extent of its spread is something which is so far pretty well known, although it's still early days. Now, as that may have a bearing on the viral load, so which age group of children you think would be most vulnerable to it? I mean, the newborns, uh, uh, I mean, the younger ones, the early teens, teenagers, which age group you would mark out as the most vulnerable one? See, Rajat, actually, uh, like for the COVID per se, the general age group, the most vulnerability is always in the extremes of the ages. Mm -hmm. Like the infantile age group, the less than one year is definitely yeah. the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And if we see the mortality and the severity of disease wise, in the Asian population, we have seen in our Indian setup, in our uh, local data also, that the less than five years were having a severe disease. However, uh, some of the spectrum seen in the American, the Western countries was uh, in the 5 to 10 years of age group. So the, there are differences in the severity and the uh, hospitalization with respect to the, it differs with respect to the ethnic and the geographical region also. So there right, are differences, right. probably some immune makeup. The general possibility of disease like as we have seen because as been discussed, even with the mutation, uh, the, whatever data is there even in the adults, the severity of the disease and the fatality, there, not, there has not been much change as such. Definitely the okay. transmission has increased. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, so we also see the similar, the similar precautions till now what we are taking has to be taken more vigilantly because mm -hmm. the general perception among the general public is that, that the children, uh, the children cannot have COVID or they are immune to COVID. So that mm -hmm. is a general perception, even though, even in the many of the groups I have seen. So that perception has to be, you know, uh, that guard that the children require equal barrier. They require, they could be the spreader. And definitely the less than one year or the one to five years age group, the children with the comorbidities like the obesity, 
the any immunocompromised children uh, suppose leukemia or tuberculosis children with chronic diseases genetic disorders they okay. definitely need a more guard more they are more vulnerable to get the disease as such and mm -hmm. since they are more vulnerable definitely the transmission with increased transmission the vulnerability will increase further regarding mm -hmm. the newborn uh, till now whatever data has come it has it is very good with respect to the newborns Uh, most of the newborns in the newborn the positivity rate has come just around 8 to 10 percent in okay, most of okay. the studies right. and they are uh, mostly asymptomatic so most there in fact no mortality uh, in mm. our hospital has been uh, you know documented in the newborns born to the covid positive mother so mm. in newborns probably some antibodies from the mother must be playing the role so investigations are still on the studies mm. research is going on but newborn generally have come out very well and uh, one to five year and the less than five year age group with the children with comorbidity becomes a uh, more vulnerable so the children need to taught about the uh, you know the barrier the social distancing and definitely if a child is symptomatic to take precautions because mm -hmm. generally uh, you know parents are not bringing children to the hospital because they are there is a you know uh, uh, they don't want to come to the hospital or they are coming only when the child becomes sick enough so to seek the medical advice early in mm. the disease a child presents with any symptoms that is crucial and important for the treatment as well as to spread the disease from the children to the other members and the other community members right so right yeah yeah please ma'am go ahead yeah you just yeah. about to finish so these things yeah become important and also to follow the routine like the routine activities uh, what is happening because of the covid uh, many of immunization is getting delayed so you know the immunocompromised children or the other children they are getting the other immunocompromised disease also so the mm. to get the immunization on time whatever is the immunization right. detail so right. there is a lagging behind the preventive services so those okay. services have to be strengthened to maintain the immunity of the child as well mm. because the child gets struck in with other diseases also it has been seen that dengue along with covid was very severe in disease if the child mm. gets we are getting cases where the child is positive for dengue as well as he has covid right, and when the right. disease get the child has typhoid fever along with that the child is having a covid so when the two diseases struck along with that the disease becomes severe enough you know right, so the Dr. parents Dr. have to be right. aware that to be vigilant and to seek medical advice right on time right. and to follow the sms of social distancing and masking as well in the coming times also sure. right, right 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 thanks uh, dr gupta Uh, Professor Vasan, uh, now this is a fairly hypothetical question. <laughs> It may seem like uh, now suppose uh, there is a recovered person who has just recovered from COVID-19. Does our immune system has intelligence to identify with the existing virus and the new mutant? What what I'm asking here is, will a person who has just recovered from the COVID-19 or has recovered from the COVID-19 in the past? is it is he or she also vulnerable to the new mutant um <clears throat> see this is a very interesting question so this is one of the things we discussed last night in the who teleconference so mm -hmm. the the big questions now are so we've established that it is more transmissible mm -hmm. the next question is will the convalescence be cross protected and along the same vein will the vac current vaccines particularly the leading vaccines hmm. the pfizer the astrazeneca and the moderna vaccine will they cross protect that's a big question hmm. uh, on the same vein what about the therapeutics you know will will that still work diagnostics there is some uh, impact on some of the diagnostics so that's something that uh, we are currently discussing and finally you know is, is there uh, is this new variant likely to be more stable in the environment so these are some of the big questions uh, if you think about it uh, apart from the one that you asked where we have evidence so far is that it is more transmissible mm -hmm. and that there is no evidence that it is more pathogenic or it results in a more severe disease that much we know of mm -hmm. course we have continued this is based on the initial data which involves mm -hmm. thousands of cases from the uk so but we need to keep um looking at the data because you know you can't just uh, take your guard down yeah Now, there is at the moment we do not believe as dr das also mentioned that based on what we know uh, we don't believe that the existing vaccines will be affected mm -hmm. or that convalescence will not be cross protected but uh, we scientists you know <laughs> proof of the pudding is 
you have to do the experiments and you have to get it peer reviewed and Absolutely. published. Yeah. And that the current rate, uh, we feel that it will be at least end of January, early February, because the rest of the laboratories around the world have to get the particular variant mm -hmm. from the UK from Public Health England, and they are still passaging it. So uh, until they are ready to provide this to the rest of the world, we can't mm -hmm. do those studies. Uh, and so, but what I will say on a positive note is that there is extraordinary collaboration between scientists around the world. Traditionally, rival groups are now setting all that aside and they are actually working so well together, So, right. which I'm quite Absolutely. proud of. So I don't think that will be a problem. Now, the other two points I would like to mention based mm -hmm. on previous speakers. So you asked me earlier uh, what other precautions we need to mm -hmm. take. Mm -hmm. So don't forget uh, people who care for the younger children. So mm -hmm. I want to talk about that. So one of the ways in which this virus can spread is through the oral fecal route, which means okay. if you are uh, changing the nappy or your uh, the child has gone to the toilet and you are uh, mm. cleaning the child or you are, um, the child has a runny nose and you are uh, you know, looking after the child, you have to really ensure that uh, after you clean the child, uh, you have to wash your hand with soap and water using the same standard. There's nothing dramatically new. It's the same yeah. whatever of India tells you. Just keep doing it more regularly. And this is a point you might miss where you are extra vigilant to sanitize when you are coming from shopping, but your own grandchildren or children, you fail to uh, wash your hands because you somehow think uh, that, you know, they're not, you, you don't look at them as Absolutely. potential. Absolutely. Yeah, but they actually can shed virus. And this goes back mm. to the point Das That's was making. That's very important, Dr. So if there is a higher viral load, you yeah, have to be yeah. particularly vigilant, right? And the other right. point I to mention briefly is that it's not just the UK uh, variant, okay? So mm -hmm. there are two variants now. One is in South Africa and one is in the UK. Mm. Okay, and these two are not exactly identical. So they do share several of the mutations, but they're not the same. So when you are actually screening for passengers, one of the mm. recommendations I would say is that we also need to be uh, able to screen for passengers coming from South Africa, either right. directly through transit and not, and if they are COVID positive, to be able to uh, check what strain of the virus they have. And this right, I would right, say... Right, right, uh, Professor is, Vasan. Is uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Many thanks, uh, Professor Vasan. That's a very important point that we need to be extremely careful and we need to check other strains as well. So clearly, uh, there we have all three experts, although... Uh, just assuring that there is nothing to worry at this stage. It's still early days in terms of studying this virus. Yet, we all need to be cognizant of this new strain and, of course, to COVID-19 at large. So, what do we have to do? Here is a small appeal. Please follow these steps. Wear face mask. Keep washing hands. And maintain physical or social distancing. Well, these are important things you can defeat the pandemic. Many thanks for watching this edition of India Fights Back. Please keep watching RST. Thank you.